why is because I sent the wrong verse number. Although it says 339, but we're going to read from 340. Luckily, it's from the same book, so you don't need another book. So let, let's begin by offering our basis this issue of Prabhupada. Nama Om Vishnu Braya Krishna Prasai Bhutte Shrimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tanamane Namaste Saraswati Deve Paravani Bracharane Nirvishesha Shunivari Asya Jade Sadhane. Is it better with the earphones or, or it doesn't matter? Normal. I'm fine either way, Hare Krishna Maharaj. So it's Bhagavad Gita 340. And I'll read the Sanskrit. Indriyani Mano Budira, Asya Deshtanam Uchate, Eteravi Mohajatesha, Jnanam Avritya Dehinam. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace. A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami to the Prabhupada. The senses, the mind, and the intelligence are the sitting places of this lust. Through them, lust covers the real knowledge of the living entity and bewilders it. Purport. The enemy has captured different strategic positions in the body of the conditioned soul. And therefore, Lord Krishna is giving hints of those places so that one who wants to conquer the enemy may know where he can be found. Mind is the center of all the activities of the senses. And thus, when we hear about sense objects, the mind generally becomes a reservoir of all ideas of sense gratification. And as a result, the mind and the senses become the repositories of lust. Next, the intelligence department becomes the capital of such lustful propensity. Intelligence is the immediate next door neighbor of the spirit soul. Lust, the intelligence, influences the spirit soul, acquire the false ego, and identify itself with matter, and thus with the mind and senses. The spirit soul becomes addicted to enjoying the material senses, mistakes this is true happiness. This false identification of the spirit soul is very nicely explained in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Esyatma buddhi kunape tri daduke swadi kalatradi shu boma ijadi etirta bude sahale nakarahi chij ganesh vabhadre vabhi ganeshu saeva gokara. A human being who identifies himself with his body made of three elements, the self, who considers the byproducts of the body to be his kinsmen, who considers the land of birth worshipable, and who goes to the place of pilgrimage simply to take a bath, rather than meet men of transcendental knowledge, it, there is to be considered like an ass or a cow. So the verse again. Indriyani mano budira asya deshtanam uchate etera vimohoja yesha yanam vritya dehinam. The senses, the mind, and the intelligence are the sitting places of this lust. Through them, lust covers the real knowledge of living entity and bewilders him. Oma gana tvinandasya gananjana salakaya taksur militam yena tasmai shi gurudena maha. The preceding verses are actually quite important to understand what Krishna is saying here in this verse. This is from the third chapter of Bhagavad Gita, so it deals with our activities and basically speaking, what does it mean, duty? What is the actual purpose of life and how to achieve, achieve it? Now, at the very beginning of this chapter, 
Arjuna was asking about what his duty is. And Krishna explains in, in the chapter, ultimately, that one has to regulate the senses according to scripture, as we'll find throughout Bhagavad Gita. And then he says one verse, which is quite important, which is found twice in the Bhagavad Gita. Shreyan Swadama Vibhuna Para Dharma Swanusika. Shrey Dhami Nidanam Shreya Para Dharma Vyavaha. That it's better to perform one's own duty unsuccessfully than to do someone else's duty even successfully. Destruction in the cause of one's own duty is better because to follow someone else's duty is dangerous. In other words, we have two kinds of duties called Swadharma. One is the psychophysical nature, the duties according to the psychophysical nature that we require, our body. And in that psychophysical nature, we have generally what we can say a shape. We have the spiritual abilities we require through devotional service. For instance, before we joined the Hare Krishna movement, most of us might not have been musicians. The only time we heard our, we sung is maybe in school when everyone else was singing. Or maybe we sung along with a wet record like the Beatles or something. But singing along with the Beatles doesn't give us very much realization. At least not spiritual. But when we sing Hare Krishna, when we perform devotional service, we discover that abilities such as relating to people, performing activities that normally we wouldn't do, selling books, transcendental literature, or going out in the public and singing Hare Krishna. We discover we have some talents that we never really thought we had before, some abilities that didn't seem like it was part of our nature, but appeared through our devotional service. And then we have our heart, activities that we generally like to do. They make us feel good. Some people like to sing, some devotees like to read books, some devotees like to dance. So many things that we like to do that make us feel that we're doing something worthwhile that we like to do. And then we have our natural abilities from birth, our karmic abilities. Some devotees are good speakers, Others are very personal and they like to relate to people. They enjoy others' company. Uh, these are inherent qualities that we have. And then we have our personality. Some devotees are naturally introverted. Others are very extroverted. And then we have our experience in the course of performing devotional service. In the course of life itself, we gain so much experience that we can offer as service. So this is our Swadharma. Now, in the Vedic culture, there are some people who are naturally scholars, preachers, uh, teachers, and there are persons who are naturally organizers or leaders of society in some way. And there are persons who like to accumulate wealth in different ways. And there are people who or naturally assistance to others. They don't have any special talent, but they understand the necessity of cooperation in society. And they like to assist those who are superior to them. So similarly, these are in the Vanashram system, are known as Brahmanas, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, and Shudras. And anyone who's not a Brahmana, a Kshatriya, a Vaishya, or a Shudra, 
is considered to be a Yavana or a Malecha or even lower than that. In this age, Kalo, Sudra, Sambhava, we were all born as Shudras. And then as Shil Bhakti Nota Kora says, that by modern education, we are trained up to become less than an animal. But by good fortune, Brahmande, Brahmate, Kon, Bhagavan, Ji, Guru, Krishna, Prasadi, Pai, Bhakti, Latavi. The good fortune we come in contact with a pure devotee like Srila Prabhupada and by following his example and his teachings we come to perform devotional service. Now devotional service itself for instance everyone can chant Hare Krishna and chanting Hare Krishna is on a spiritual platform especially when it's done offenselessly, avoiding the 10 offenses. So this Swadharma is a spiritual Swadharma and it can substitute for any material Swadharma. That there's no need, as Prabhupada writes, in the nectar of devotion to change one's whatever one is doing and try to become a Brahmin, a Kshatriya, a Vaishya, or Shudra, that just by performing devotional service, that is following Sri Rupa Goswami's instructions in nectar devotion, and especially chanting Hare Krishna, worshiping the deities, hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, serving the devotees, and living in a holy place or making one's the atmosphere spiritual by worshiping the deities or preaching Krishna consciousness. So th these activities themselves spiritualize our existence. And if one was purely engaged in these five powerful activities, especially chanting the holy name and hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, well, they're all important. Then there would be no need to designate oneself in any particular vana and ashram. Now, of course, nowadays, we don't generally fit so clearly into any vana and ashram because we don't even know what the duties are for a vana and ashram. And even if we did, we might not be able to perform all of them. Even a good shudra, an, an elevated shudra, is not so easy to imitate in Kali Yuga because the Shudra is submissive and most of us are not 100% submissive to any authority. Nor are we protecting cows. Nor are we tilling the land like Krishna and Balaram. Most of the ladies that I know aren't churning butter. Although they do make garlands sometimes like they do in the spiritual world. In any case, we, we're not so much inclined even to the qualities of a Vaisha, cow protection, agriculture, and trade. And what to speak of a Kshatriya? Uh, Surya Teja Jiti Daksha Yide Chapipalayanam Dhanam Ishra Bhavas Chad Shatram Karma Subhavita. Most of us are not about to lead, being the head of an of a army in a battle. Nor will we have very much resources to be generous. Nor are we that determined in whatever we're doing. In other words, to have the, the qualities of a exalted Shatya is very rare in this age. And even the qualities of Brahman, Sama, Dhamma, Tapa, Socham, Shantir, Arjun, Evacha, Jnana, Vijnana, Astikyam, Brahma, Karma, Sabhavajam. Uh, even these qualities are exalted and certainly we're aiming for them. 
out of these qualities, Shri Prabhupada has mentioned, that especially cleanliness and truthfulness are very important. Truthfulness means that one sees every, ultimately truthfulness means that one sees everything in relation to Krishna and acts accordingly. And of course, cleanliness means external cleanliness. Or is it even after we drink water, we should wash our hands. At least we should rinse them with water. And internal cleanliness means to always think about Krishna and never forget him. In any case, these qualities are not so easy to acquire without Krishna consciousness. So our main business is Krishna consciousness. And at the same time, we want to cultivate these qualities because these qualities of uh, especially Brahminical qualities allow us to fully experience Krishna consciousness. Or as Shula Prabhupada said, we have two businesses. One is to chant Hare Krishna and the other is to create the atmosphere by which we'll become more and more receptive to the holy names. The mode of goodness is especially creating the atmosphere by which we can chant offenselessly and become receptive to experiencing Krishna's and Shumati Rarani's presence in the holy name. So that's our duty, but at the same time we should understand because we're not completely or we're not necessarily on the platform of full consciousness of Krishna. We still have a duty with this body. We still have to perform activities. There are two different ashram, there are the ashram, and then there is the occupation. Ashram is basically speaking to gradually regulate sense gratification. And occupation is more or less to help us get something to eat, some covering for the body, place to stay. That's basically occupation. To get the resources necessary to maintain the body so we can learn how to regulate our senses, so we can fix our mind upon Krishna. Now, generally speaking, in Kali Yuga, people always think the grass is greener on the other side. Therefore, practically speaking, one of the qualities of Kali Yuga is that the mind is always disturbed. We think others are happy and that we're the only ones in the world, in the universe, who are not happy. And so therefore we're always looking for someone as an example that we can follow. Therefore we see, especially children are very influential. If they go and see a movie like Spider-Man, then suddenly we find so many children putting on Spider-Man costumes. I remember when I was younger, Superman was the main hero. And children used to buy Superman capes and uniforms. And some of them even thought that if they had the cape and the uniform on, they could jump off buildings. Those stories don't have a very good happy ending, by the way. They literally learn the hard way that if you just put on a particular dress, you don't necessarily acquire mystic power. In any case, everyone has a tendency to imitate or at least to follow some superior. And that following superior, generally speak, speaking, means that we're thinking that someone by their activities will attain more happiness than we're experiencing. And therefore, we identify activities, certain activities with happiness. For instance, people think that if I have a lot of wealth, then I'll be happy. Others think that if I have a lot of knowledge, I'll be happy. Others think if I don't have much responsibility, I'll be happy. 
And others just think if I can give up all responsibility, I'll be happy. But spiritual life means to understand that actual happiness is to change our consciousness to Krishna consciousness, to do something, to do something for Krishna so that Krishna is pleased and we remember him. Now, without experiencing Krishna consciousness, without actually being engaged also, according to our natural propensities, no one will actually feel satisfied. Unfortunately, in Kali Yuga, number one, people don't even know what their natural propensities are. And if they find out what their natural propensities are, what they're actually, where their heart is at, where their experience is, where their abilities are, where their personalities, often our parents will discourage us from pursuing such an occupation. And even if our parents don't discourage us, our friends, society, if we tell people in society that I'm going to become a cowherd boy or a cowherd boy, I'm going to protect cows. How many of our parents will think, wow, I'm so proud of him. I'm so happy you finally you found a very wonderful occupation. I can't wait to tell our other relatives, but my son or daughter has become a cowherd boy or a cowherd girl. Now, generally speaking, most people in this age have some idea of what's a good occupation and what's not a good occupation. And generally, good occupations are those who simply get so-called money and bad occupations are those who don't pay very well. No matter what the occupation may be, it's all judged by how much money you can get. And often the activities or the occupations that pay a good salary are not very conducive to spiritual consciousness. In other words, technology and industrialization have become the criteria for advancement of human society. While actually it degrades people, spot finer spiritual qualities and consciousness, but still people are mad after technology and industrialization. They don't like this world, they want to live in a virtual world. But Christian consciousness is different. Christian consciousness recognizes that we don't really have to work like a dog so we can eat like a hog and sleep like a bear and have sex like a pigeon. That's not the ultimate purpose of existence. And therefore, if we find some something to do that will actually be more in line with our, first of all, make our obtaining the necessities of life as simple as possible. Krishna consciousness is not something impractical that we're just going to sit underneath a tree and chant Hare Krishna. That will not go on for very long. We have to have some occupation, but that occupation hopefully should be such as much as possible that it doesn't interfere with our consciousness. At the same time, it makes maintaining this body as simple as possible. So that may differ, that will differ from each one of us, but at least that should be thought of, of ide more of an ideal occupation for maintaining our body and soul together. And we should like our occupation, hopefully, but that may not always be possible, so we do the needful. On the other hand, engagement in Krishna service, which is voluntary, should certainly, especially at the beginning, align with our 
spiritual abilities, our, per, our heart, our abilities, our personality, and our experience. But in any case, our main business on the spiritual platform is to hear about Krishna. To hear about Krishna so that we can appreciate how wonderful Krishna is and how powerful Krishna is, how Krishna pervades everything, how everything belongs to Krishna, so that we become inspired to do something for him. If we only hear about how powerful Krishna is, we, that may incline us to do something for Krishna, but we also have to hear about how nice he is too. Out of fear, we can, we'll only be inspired to do so much. But if we find out that he's a coward boy in Goloka Vrindavan, ultimately, or that ultimately he's a coward boy in Goloka Vrindavan as his highest form, and that he's loved by everyone there because he's so kind and sweet with everyone. And he has, we re develop a relation with him, then he becomes very kind and sweet with us also. Krishna considers himself to be the servant of his servants. So the more we develop a service attitude towards Krishna, the more Krishna is able to reveal his service attitude towards us. So our main business on the spiritual platform is to chant Hare Krishna, hear about Krishna, try to understand Krishna in truth, and try to live according to Krishna's instructions so that we can progressively live in the material world without disturbance. So that without disturbance, Arjuna was asking that I want to do my duty. I know what my duty is, but why don't I do it? So then Krishna says, or Arjuna asked the question, what is the force that's not preventing me to be peaceful and happy and just do what I know I should be doing. Like all of us know that life should not be so complicated, that modern society has made things excessively complicated, which makes it difficult for even to normally pra to practice easily any kind of spiritual activity. So we know that, so Arjuna is asking, I know what my duty should be, but somehow or another, I'm becoming distracted. So what's distracting me? So Krishna says, Kama Esha, Krota Esha, Kama, Kama Esha, Krota Esha, Rajaguna Samudbhava, Mahashana, Mahapatma, Vidina, Mihavarina. That is lust only, Arjuna, which is born in the material mode of passion and later transformed into wrath which is the all-devouring sinful enemy of this world. So we can't see lust. I mean, no one is, I don't think anyone has ever taken a picture of lust and put up a poster, enemy number one. Report, if you see lust on site, report to the nearest authority to get rid of. Now lust is very subtle. Without being subtle, it couldn't bewilder the subtle intelligence and the subtle mind of the soul and even the gross senses of the soul. The so soul lust is subtle and its manifestation, such as anger and greed and the illusion that that produces is also quite subtle. So then Krishna goes on to explain that in the human form of life, especially, lust is there, it's covered, but it's not as deep, it's not as intense as in the animal form of life or in the vegetable form of life. In the human form of life, it's compared to fire covering smoke. I should say smoke covering fire. That it's there, it makes our consciousness cloudy. It distracts us, but there's an element of 
intelligence, consciousness within the soul, that when the soul, if he's not degraded himself, when he hears the truth, he can identify with it. And therefore, there's a possibility of not only identifying with it, but try to understand it and apply it practically within one's life. And as Krishna sees, one is practically trying to apply within one's life his teachings, then he helps from within and helps the soul clarify and see things properly so that it becomes easier to understand what the path of perfection is. But in the previous verse to this one, Krishna said, Avritam jena etena, jnani no nityavarina, kamarupena kuntia, dusprena analena cha. Thus, a man's pure consciousness is covered by his eternal enemy in the form of lust, which is never satisfied and, bewild and bewilders him. So here, Krishna is repeating the same thing again, that lust covers us, our real knowledge, our spiritual consciousness, and bewilders us. But we can understand how it works, and when we understand how it works, we can easily conquer it. As it explains here, hearing is the most important hmm, weapon we have against lust. It is so simple that it's easily, easily we can disregard it. Just hearing about Krishna elevates us to the spiritual platform immediately. The difficulty is sometimes when we're elevated to the platform of spiritual consciousness, where we're not disturbed so much by material energy, we take it for granted. We get used to it. And we take it as a normal state of consciousness. We forget what it was like previously to not know that we're not this body, not to know that we're eternal, not to know that there's a supreme person who's our ultimate destination to revive our relationship with him. We take it for granted after some time and become somewhat complacent. We forget what it was like to be in total ignorance of one's spirit, of spiritual knowledge. Therefore, it's necessary that each one of us, every one of us, we have every day a morning program. If we're not in a temple where we have the good fortune of being able to get up early in the morning and see the deities, worship Tulsi, chant Hare Krishna together, chant Japa, hear Shrimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita. In other words, the, not, the five powerful processes of devotional service be associated with them in the morning and in the evening, then we have to do the same thing in our house. Luckily, in most countries, there's no law against practicing Krishna consciousness in one's house. Now, King Vena, he made a declaration to stop all sacrifice, that all the Brahmins had to stop, stop their sacrifice Luckily, the Brahmins were powerful enough that they stopped King Vena. But we're fortunate. We can practice Krishna consciousness. It's not that when we pick up our japa beads, someone appears from a telescreen telling us to stop. Put those beads down. You're under arrest. No, we can chant Hare Krishna in our house with our family. We can have deities, at least a picture of Panchatattva. We can offer our, our prasadam to them, our food to them. We're very fortunate. Uh, there's no need to live in a temple or even go to a temple if it's inconvenient. Although the temple has generally the opportunity to associate with many varieties of devotees. We're in, generally in our house or 
it may not be so possible unless we have a really big family. Still, there's no difference between chanting Hare Krishna in our house and chanting in the temple. It's not that Krishna says, I reveal myself when you're in the temple, but anywhere else, good luck. But Krishna is equally everywhere, just like he's equally in our heart. It's not that when we go into the temple, Krishna enters into our heart and we leave him, he disappears. But Krishna is always there. And we can worship him anywhere at any time. There is a Brahmin who couldn't go to a temple, but he, he learned during a Bhagavad Sattaha that you can sit down and meditate anywhere and perform devotional service to Krishna. And indeed, he did that for many, many years. He'd sit there, perform some pranayama, and then within his mind, he imagined deities. And he imagined collecting water in golden and silver pots, Ganges water, Narmada water, Saraswati water, Jamuna water. And he'd bring this water in the pots and bathe the deities with it. He cooked nice foodstuffs for the deity within his mind and offered them. And then one day, after many years of such practice, he cooked some sweet rice for the deities, but sweet rice should be served cold. We should know that. If you make sweet rice, make sure it's cold. So he wanted to test the sweet rice, whether or not it was cold enough to offer to the deities. So he put his finger into the sweet rice pot to test its heat, and then it was burnt. And he woke up from his trance, from his meditation, and noticed his finger was actually burnt. So he was quite surprised. But then Vaikuntha, Narayan, was laughing. And the Lakshmi's were asking Lord Narayan, why are you laughing? The Lord Narayan called for the Brahmin to be picked up by a Vaikuntha airplane and brought him to, back to Vaikuntha, where he told the story to everyone's satisfaction. So in other words, we all have the, the opportunity to perform devotional service anywhere at any time, but we should do it regularly, because the tendency is to forget. There's so much distraction going on in the material world that without a regulated devotional service, both in the morning and hopefully in the evening also, that we can associate with the holy name. We can hear Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita. We can worship the deity. We can serve the devotees or hear from them, whether it be our children or our husband or our wife, whatever. And we can make the atmosphere spiritual just by performing devotional service. So this is our duty. And this is the main duty of the preachers. This is what we really want to encourage others to do. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna mentions different duties for the sannyasi. Different qualities, actually, such as abhayam sattva samshudira jnana yoga viryasthiti. Fearlessness, purification one's existence, and the cultivation of spiritual knowledge. Similarly, in the, 18, in the 13th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna mentions what are the qualities of knowledge? What qualities do we have to cultivate to come to acquire spiritual consciousness? And there he mentions that nitya samachita atvam putra dharagrihadishu, that detachment from wife, children, home, and the rest. So this detachment, Prabhupada said, doesn't mean we don't have affection for our wife and children, our husband. These are natural objects of affection. 
but we try to serve them by giving them the highest benediction, highest benefit, by sitting down with them morning and evening and chant Hare Krishna together. Hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, worshiping the deity, offering our food, that this is the best way to serve the family. If we do that, family life may not be perfect, but there's no need to change from family life to any other life. If one is performing these devotional activities, one has transcended material life, transcended material designation. One is even above a sannyasi. So this is the main duty of any devotee in the society, whether it's sannyasi or whatever, especially to encourage the grihastas, encourage everyone to have a regular program in their house of devotional activities. There's no need to make things complicated. We don't need elaborate festivals, although they're nice, all the, but the main thing, the main foundational point is that everyone should have a regular sadhana. This will elevate one to the highest devotional perfection. So here in this particular verse, Prabhupada mentions that if we, hearing is so important, but we should hear things that are foundational that will actually help us advance in devotional service. Now, in the material world, due to lack of knowledge, people don't know what's to be done and what's not to be done. So I've given this example many times. Then a man's walking down the street and he sees an attractive woman and immediately the mind will tell him, go get her. Because there's nothing else for a man to, or a woman to do in this material world and seek after sense gratification, especially in Kali Yuga. But then the intelligence, if there is any intelligence left, will tell the man, wait a second. She has another man work, walking next to him, her, and she, he might be her husband. Besides that, she has this red dot or some kind of dot on her forehead. And I heard somewhere that that means that she might be married. But the intelligence may be so weak and the mind may be so strong and the desires may be so strong that the intelligence says, oh, don't listen to, oh, the mind may say in the senses, oh, don't listen to this foolish intelligence. No one believes this so-called philosophy anymore. There's only one philosophy. If it feels good, then you do it. That's the only reality. Everything else is a myth. So then the soul has to decide, what is he going to do? If he has little intelligence, then actually he'll simply be inclined towards trying to make arrangements for his sense gratification. That's all he lives for. And therefore he, he asks the intelligence, my dear intelligence, I've decided to try to enjoy this woman. So please tell me how to do it. So then one is fully under the control of the false ego with such a decision. And the intelligence will say, write her a letter and tell her that she's the most beautiful woman he's, you've seen. And in very small letters, right, in the last two weeks. Tell her you're madly in love with her. She should meet you in such and such time, at such and such place, and you'll give her the sun and the moon. And if she's very nice to you, you'll also include a couple of extra stars. Tell her to come alone, because the intelligence will say that this man is twice as big as you are. It wouldn't be a good idea if he was there. So in this way, one becomes not only captivated by the idea of enjoying someone, but one will actually make the arrangements in order to do so. Sometimes a great risk and expense. 
But if the soul has some intelligence, if he's actually studied the philosophy of Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, when he sees this man and woman together, he may think, here's an opportunity to distribute a, a Bhagavad Gita and a Krishna book to them. So he'll go up to them with a Bhagavad Gita and a Krishna book and say, my dear lady and gentleman, you're the nicest couple I've seen in the last two weeks. That this book, these books are perfect for you because you're very intelligent. You'll certainly understand them and this will enhance all your good qualities. So please take these books and read them. So in this way, one is using his intelligence to relate to the same man and woman, but in a spiritual way rather than a material way. So that depends upon when, whether one has heard from the Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, or one has heard from the Rolling Stones or some other musical group. So everything depends upon hearing. We hear from the right source with the right attitude. Then we can know what to do to, as it says here, liberate ourselves from the material bondage to material lust and anger and greed and illusion and forgetfulness and lack of real intelligence. This is our opportunity. And this opportunity is best fulfilled if we have a regular program in our house. And if we're fortunate enough to live near a temple, then we should have regular to go regularly to the temple as much as feasible as possible. Or if we live in the society near the other devotees, we should form association with other devotees where we can meet with them regularly and hear and chant together. Become inspired not only to hear and chant, but also inspire to deepen our relationships with each other, to help each other in every possible way, advance spiritually, and to provide even with the necessities of life needed. And at the same time, how to deepen our spiritual commitment, how to accept Sharanagati, how to accept things which are favorable for devotional service, inspire each other to do that, how to give up things which are unfavorable for devotional service, how to become convinced that Krishna will actually protect us and maintain us, how to become convinced eventually that I have no other interest outside of Krishna's interest, and to develop an attitude of being always meek and humble that even if one is qualified to do something, feel that without Krishna's help, one will no, not be able to do it successfully. Then, in such association, we come, become inspired to do more and more service, either within our family or within the greater society. And then we'll be able, we'll have the intelligence and the conviction and the inspiration that whoever we meet, whether it be our family members or our friends, or even people on the outside, to utilize our intelligence given by Krishna so that we can inspire them and assist them in making some advancement towards their relation with Krishna. In other words, simple life, simply centered on Krishna and simply receiving Krishna's mercy from doing, by doing so then this confusion will go away. We'll understand more clearly what our ultimate spiritual interest is and the means of obtaining it very simply. Chan Hare Krishna, Hir Shemad Bhagavatam Bhagavad Gita, worship the deities, hear, uh, serve the devotees and try and make the atmosphere spiritual. While at the same time, we, we have to struggle in material existence, maintain ourselves, but we won't have to struggle to obtain unnecessary things. We don't necessarily need a bigger house or a newer car or another pet lizard 
whatever I think we think we, we need, that life will become more simple and more focused on Krishna. And the more it's focused on Krishna, the more we can give our love to Krishna, the more our life spiritually will become successful. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Yes, Guru Maharaj, in Zoom chat, one question. Can you read, please, because this question in Russian? Um, Hare Krishna, please accept my uh, obeisances. Guru Dev, thank you so much for the lecture. My question is, a few years ago, um, uh, I, I was dis, um, let's say discouraged in um, a book distribution. Uh, and I cannot uh, step over my um, distaste in the book distribution anymore. Uh, should I, uh, over my... Um, over my personal, um, should I step over this and just go and try to distribute books anyway? Maybe, maybe not. First of all, if we want to, if we're discouraged, I don't know what the reason for the discouragement is. In any case, what we should do is associate with devotees who are enthusiastic to do that, who are knowledgeable how to do it, in such a way as that it, it is it leads naturally to Krishna consciousness. It's not necessarily that the devotees who can distribute the most books are the best associate, to associate with, to become inspired to distribute books. Although it's nice if you can distribute someone can distribute a lot of books, but it's also how one is distributing books how one can understand who to distribute a book to and how to do it in order to inspire them and inspire oneself in developing one's Krishna consciousness. So I want you to associate with someone who is inspirational in their book distribution and learn from them what they're doing and how they're doing it. If that's not possible or practical, Book distribution, although a very exalted service in the sense that hopefully, if it's done properly, it brings us into intimate contact with the super soul who begins to guide us so we can act as an instrument for his, his desire to bring his children back to the spiritual world, of which the distribution of transcendental knowledge is the beginning of one's progress in spiritual life. That is receiving transcendental knowledge. So it's a very important activity, which Krishna mentions at the end of the Bhagavad Gita, that no one is more dear to him. Even if it's at the beginning not done with much enthusiasm or much conviction, if it's done with at least some determination, then it, it may awaken one's transcendental awareness of how to rely upon Krishna in order to do that activity. So it's done in such a way it brings one to the feeling that one is becoming closer to Krishna, that one is actually being guided by Krishna and protected by Krishna, and things are being arranged by Krishna. But if one doesn't experience that, if one is actually not able to focus the mind upon Krishna, pray for his mercy, and utilize one's intelligence in getting his, so that one can relate to others in such a way as to be productive, give them the book and have a pleasant exchange with them, a spiritual exchange with them, then one can always chant Hare Krishna, go on Hare Nam, distribute prasadam and wait for the time where we can get nice association, nice inspiration. We can feel close to Krishna and inspired to, to please him that by bringing Krishna's other children back to the spiritual kingdom, by introducing them to the knowledge of Krishna consciousness. It's not the only service. 
And maybe it's, if one is averse to it, it's not a good idea to, without intelligence, without proper guidance, without proper understanding of how to do the service, simply blindly do it in the hope that somehow or another things will turn out to be the bet for the better. And one should have, one should feel oneself, as Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Tasmat Agana Sambhutam, Ritstam Gyana Sanatmanaha, Vidvainam Samchanyam Yogam, Atishta Tishta Bharata. These doubts, which have arisen in your heart out of ignorance, should be slashed with a weapon of knowledge that armed with yoga, O Bharata, stand and fight. So we should go out to the battlefield of preaching armed with transcendental knowledge. Not without any armor, without any clothing, simply battling against our, our own demons. And before we even distribute a book to anyone else, our, the demons within our mind have already slain us because we don't have su sufficient transcendental knowledge how to defeat even the demons within our own mind what to speak of the demons within other people's minds. Is that right? Okay, anything else? Okay, we can stop here. Thank you very much. Grantaraj, Shmad Bhagavad Gita, Kijai. Srila Prabhupada, Kijai. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you.